this is Herschel Gordon Lewis, and you are listening to WithoutYourHead.com. Uh, we are joined by Buddy Cooper, who is the director of the 1985 film The Mutilator. I want to welcome you to Without Your Head. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. Cool. Uh, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing fine. How you like my tux? Oh, excellent. <laughs> Looks good, nice. didn't it? Yeah, I yeah, like my mother. I, I like my when mother made it. I like my when mother made it. <laughs> it's always good when people get dressed up to come on without your head. It's most a special night for me. Mm-hmm. Now you got uh, this weekend. You actually have a big show. You're having a, a reunion for uh, the Mutilator, and that's going to be in Hagerstown, Maryland, the Horror Cinema Expo 2008. And uh, if you that's want, right. yeah, for more information where you can get your tickets and everything, you can go to Horror Cinema. CinemaExpo.com, and we'll have the the link right on the website, so it'll be a lot easier to find out. Or you can also call one eight seven seven four seven seven five eight one seven to uh, you know to order your tickets, and uh, they're very reasonably priced. They're like ten dollars for a one day pass. That's a good deal. Yeah. Is this the first time that they've had a um, a reunion for the Mutilator? It is. Uh... Let's see, Timothy Beal is the guy putting this thing on. He called and said he uh, promoted these things and would like to have one that was mutilator-themed. I said, sure, go for it. And he said, well, we we understand there's never been a cast reunion, and, and maybe we could have a cast reunion and be the first ever cast and crew reunion. And I said, yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun. And so I gave him the contact information for all the cast and crew members I was still in touch with. And uh, he found some on his own, and he's he's gotten a few of us, and uh, some of us are going to show up there. Have you? Uh, so you've you've kept in contact with um, with the cast? Some of them. Uh, it was an unusual shoot in that a lot of lasting friendships were formed. Uh, the uh, the department heads were all union folks from New York City. But we didn't have a lot of money, and uh, John Douglas, my co-director, who was uh, professor of film at the American University in D.C., whose house I'm in right now, uh, came down and brought some graduate students and some recently graduated students from the film department at AU to fill out the department. So we have a professional department head and a handful of people who've never been on a real movie set filling it out. They all learned quickly. And uh, as it turned out, most of the department heads were single guys from New York, and most of the students were single women from all over. And as I say, some lasting friendships were made. In fact, a couple of marriages resulted. So, yeah, I was in touch with six or eight or ten of the people that have been through the years, and they have stayed in touch with each other. So it's sort of a network. You get in touch with one of them, and each one knows one or two other people like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Have you guys gotten together before or just contact through, like, uh, telephone? Uh, no, uh, no, no, we have not gotten together. Uh, I mean, uh, not more than one or two of us. We've never tried to do anything organized like this, no. Mm-hmm. So you're looking forward to uh, not just meeting the fans, but uh, meeting everybody again, you know, in person? Well, so, yeah, uh, Ruth, Ruth Martinez will be there, and Matt Midler. I haven't seen them in uh, over 20 years. I saw Matt once after the shoot, but I haven't seen Ruthie since... Just to shoot. Yeah, I haven't seen them in, in a long time. I'm not sure who from the crew is coming. I know Ed Farrell, who held uh, several positions. He's in, he was started out in the makeup department. Ed's going to be there. He's here with me, in fact. We're going together. Uh, uh, and I, I really, right now, I can't remember who else is coming. Yeah. Well, everybody can check out against uh, HorrorCinemaExpo.com, and it's going to be in Hagerstown, Maryland, at the Horror Cinema Expo 2008. Have have you yourself done any like uh, shows and like met the fans and uh, done autographs or you know questions? No, I have. I have not. I, it's the first time I've been invited. Uh, usually, people throw things when I when I show up. No, that's a joke. <laughs> uh, are you surprised that people uh, you know like still remember the movie and they still talk about it? Yeah, yeah. I had a real good pal in Winston Salem, Mickey DeBrule, and. He and his family used to keep me informed. It turned out there was a cult following in Winston-Salem for about three years. Uh, but since then, I haven't heard much about it. it. It was out in home video at the time. That's when it was back on VHS tape. Mm-hmm. And it went around in 25 or 26 foreign countries. Uh, but not much since then. And so 
when uh, Timothy contacted me and then a couple other guys contacted me and you contacted me, it was it was quite a surprise to find out that people were still out there looking for it. <laughs> and uh, it just tickles us all to death. <laughs> is, is there any plans to uh, put the put the movie out on DVD? We're working on that. Uh, outfit called Code Red has contacted me and asked if they could have the North American rights. And uh, Tim- Timothy, somebody from France contacted Timothy, and they want the French rights. And we're trying to get the elements together. Unfortunately, the, the CRI, the color reversal inter-negative, got lost through the years. I, I know where it went, but there's no way to get it back. And so we're trying to assemble a very good print which could be uh, digitized, turn into DVD. Right now we're not having a lot of luck, but we're working on it. Um, how about, uh, has anyone ever come to you like uh, wanting to do a remake? Because that's starting to be a popular thing. No, Nobody's approached us about a remake, no. Mm-hmm. Now, um, is there any reason why like it hasn't been on DVD yet, or is it just, uh, there's some, like you said, some problems with the... Uh... Uh, no, no, no one... Uh, offer me any money uh that's one reason <laughs> and uh, another reason is uh i just never thought well, i had toyed with the idea of doing it myself but i was i've been busy i just hadn't had time to really explore that possibility mm-hmm. yeah now what were you saying john oh i was just going to say it's definitely a movie that deserves a dvd release so i'd, I'd really look forward to it coming out do you pre- do you plan on participating in, like, a commentary track when the disc would be released? Ask me again, please, a little more slowly. Okay. Uh, would you uh, participate in, like, a commentary track where you talk over the movie and explain scenes and stuff whenever? Oh, uh, oh, uh, alternate, alternate tracks? Yeah. 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 It, uh, we, have, uh, we have all the outtakes. We have the... Uh, special effects that didn't work. Some of those were entertaining. <laughs> and uh, we've talked about getting a handful of key cast and crew members to sit around with a few bottles of wine and run the DVD or run the movie and mic everybody. And we just make our comments as we go along. Uh, I, I, I think that would be fun. Uh, it would be fun to do. I don't know how much fun it would be to watch. <laughs> <laughs> so- Obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, very memorable uh, gore scenes in the movie, and you mentioned, uh, you know, some of them didn't work. Wh- which ones just didn't didn't work out right? Well, uh, two come to mind. The uh, in the garage, the Maury Lampley character gets uh, murdered with an outboard motor. <laughs> the uh, the uh, there was a, a gag where. A, mold was made of Moore's body and a rubber body was made. The cavity was filled with uh, animal intestines and uh, movie blood and the propeller was supposed to slice through the uh, abdomen of this dummy and the gore was supposed to spill out. Well, the the uh, abdominal wall was a little bit too thick and the, the blade just wouldn't cut it. It kept knocking it down or something. I don't remember. <laughs> and so we had to skip that and, uh, and rig the propeller with a pump and a little piece of plastic tubing to spray blood on the... We removed the propeller blade and put a little plastic fan blade on there, and it sprayed blood all over Maury, and he had this prosthetic applied to his abdomen with, with the uh, gases and things already on there, and it's revealed with the camera. That was one that didn't work. The other one was uh, the Francis Rain character who uh, gets drowned in the pool in slow motion, as written, she was supposed to be floating on her back, as was in the movie, and a spear from a spear gun was supposed to pierce through her, and she looks down in shock, and it, it pulls back, the palms open and tighten on her abdomen, and she grabs for it, and of course the blood's oozing through her fingers, and the spear gun snatches her under the water that way. Mm. We were we were shooting that pool scene all night, and the sun was coming up, and it was time to kill her. And the, mm-hmm. we're waiting for the special effects crew, and they come up and say, "Well, look, we got some bad news. We can't make it work." And we <laughs> said, "What do we mean? Can't make it work?" And they said, "Well, it doesn't work." And so we uh, put our heads together and came up with the slow motion uh, drowning just on mm-hmm. the fly. It just that was, that was the best we could come up with at the moment. And take the truth, it's not half bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah I really enjoyed that scene. Uh, I really, I also enjoyed the uh, aspects of the beach at night. I thought that was a 
really like uh, horrific scenes uh, yeah. and stuff. Uh, where exactly did you film that at? It was shot in Atlantic Beach, uh, North Carolina. A few scenes shot in Moorhead City. The, uh, there's a motel there, which I run now, called the Oceana. And at the time, I had built four uh, oceanfront duplexes next door. That's where the, the condo, Big Ed's condo, was in one of those duplexes. <laughs> and because I, I still owned them all at the time, uh, we had control over that part of the beach and uh, we had the fishing pier and the motel with the swimming pool. We had control of all of that. And so it was a good, we could contain the, 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 uh, shoot. The cast and crew stayed in the motel. We just walked to work. Uh, and that was on the beach right in front. And the, the moonlight, this might be interesting to you, the moonlight reflecting off the water is from a, what they call an HMI, a big day, 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 day color balance, that temperature mm. balance. Light out on the end of a fishing pier. It wasn't the moon at all. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, you could never tell from the from the movie. Mm-mm. Uh-uh. No. Well, yeah, I said well, those guys from New York knew their stuff. They really taught us a lot. Yeah. Uh, who who just uh, who came up with the ideas for the different death scenes? Was uh were, were those all your ideas? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, uh, it just I, since we were. You know, the formula for these things, by the time I got around to doing one, was fairly set. You take a group of kids, put them in an isolated situation, and some maniac slays them. And uh, it occurred to me, we were on an island there, and uh, it just occurred to me that since we were on, on an island, to, uh, that it might be nice if the, if the maniac used nautical implements or instruments which might be found near, near on the water. Right. Yeah, because the, the, the hook scene's very memorable, of course. The what? The the uh the death by the hook. Oh yeah, well, the uh, my new my New York crew threatened not to shoot that one, and in retrospect, it's probably a, a bit much. Uh, that you... hook, that hook, look, that hook's going to be with us this weekend in Hagerstown, incidentally. Oh really? You still have the gaff, really? Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> we saying, John. I was just wondering if you had like any reservations at that time not to film that scene, other than the cat, the uh, crew uh, saying that to you. Uh, Neil, repeat that question, please. Uh, what was that again, John? Like, uh, did you d- yourself? Did you have any like, uh, like, uh, were you uneasy about filming that scene? Actually, because that's probably the most infamous scene in the movie. I think. Mike, the. Uh the movie was designed and made w- with the Gore fans in mind. Yeah. And because of that, I had no reservations about shooting the scene at the time, although uh, now that I'm older and presumably yeah. wiser, I probably would come up with a different way to do that poor girl in. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the caller just called in, just uh, tuned, uh, turned down your show so we don't get the feedback. No, I didn't turn on the show. <laughs> this is the promoter of the event for this weekend, Timothy Beal. Right. Uh, okay. I was just saying uh, we could hear the show in the background was all. We were getting a little feedback. But it's, yeah, uh, I, like to, I like to sit back and have Buddy uh, tell the stories about the film. I'd actually much rather hear, hear him talk, but uh, he's got a lot of great stories there for sure. And if people come out this weekend to see, it's going to be himself, uh, John Douglas, the co-director, the uh, special effects makeup guy, Ed Farrell, as two of the lead stars, um, Matt Midler and Francis, or excuse me, um, Ruth Martinez, uh, that played the two leads in the film. And uh, what you'll find is that these people worked very closely together on the project, had a very close, almost like, it was a, basically a big family work in this project, put a lot of time, effort, right. and dedication into right. it, and it's to be a really good film. So I just want to give my props to Buddy for his job well done on that. And uh, I look forward to seeing them all, them all this weekend, and I look forward to a great crowd there. And uh, just uh, just keep keep doing your thing, man. Thanks for calling in. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. Timothy, uh, let, uh, uh, confirm for me the hours on Saturday from 10 a.m. until 7 p.m.? Correct. Uh, okay, I talked with John earlier tonight, John Douglas. And he is not available Friday. He'll be there Saturday with us all day, though. Right, exactly. Yeah, I've talked to okay. him. Um, it's been a while, but, yeah, he should be there on Saturday. So, yeah, I'm looking forward okay. to it. I think it's going to be a great experience for all of us involved. 
So we were talking to Buddy uh, before the show, and he just mentioned that the hook's going to be there. But you're also going to be able to get the, um, the the song Fall Break from the movie he was saying uh, on uh, on record. Yeah, I've got it on 45. We've got some uh, some costumes. I brought a couple of molds. One of Ben Moore. Ben Moore played the uh, cop. We've got the mold of his head and one of his hands. And the mold that the flounder gig was made with, the phony flounder gig, the one that stabbed Ralph in the neck. Right. Uh, yeah, let's see. We've got uh, some posters and some PR photographs and some brochures. Uh, got, a, got, the, got the original screenplay. Uh, we just grabbed an arm full of stuff and, and brought it just for pick folks to see. <laughs> now, when you were originally releasing the movie, was, did any of the gore scenes, were they uh, too violent? Did they have to be edited? Yeah. Uh, the, we submitted it to the MPAA, and it was at a time when the world mood was against uh, gore pictures. Mm-hmm. The MPAA said they offered it an X rating, uh, which we declined, and so it was released unrated. The problem was once we got out of metropolitan areas like the Northeast and uh, San Francisco and L.A., uh, particularly in the Bible Belt, it was difficult to get bookings because it was considered X rated, and you know, everybody knows what X-rated means. It means sex and not violence. So mm-hmm. go figure that out. <laughs> and after a while, we were, we were just losing so much money. When we get bookings, we couldn't hold them. Uh, the newspapers wouldn't run the ads. The radio stations and the TV stations wouldn't run the spots. And so we resubmitted it to the EPAA. I don't know if you know how that works. And I don't know if it's the same way now as it was then. But at the time, they had volunteers from the PTA. Uh, led by someone, an employee of the MPAA, to look at a movie and offer comments. And they just decided that ours was a little bit rough. They told us what to cut. We had to cut it to get the R rating. But the, they told us to cut a shot that wasn't in there. They said, we want you to cut the shot where that gig goes through Ralph's neck. And we said, that doesn't happen. That shot's not in there. It doesn't happen. Well, I know it does. I've watched it. I watched it the way. We're in the editing room. I was on my way. I was on a trip. And uh, the ply had to make the airport. I said, he talked to the editor. And the editor said, no, ma'am, that, that shot's not in there. Uh, what we did was we mounted the camera upside down, put the the gig against the actor's neck. We filed off the points, of course, so it wouldn't sharp, and rolled the camera and then had Big Ed move the gig away from his neck. It's a trick when you get it get the film back from the processing lab you flip it over and run it upside down and backwards, and it, the, the uh, actors are upright, and the action is reversed. So it looks like the gig runs right up to his neck. And then the, the next cut was from behind where the things came, were sticking out, and that was a prosthetic. So the shot in between those two shots is what they wanted us to take out. We finally convinced them that it just didn't exist. <laughs> I don't know how I guess they pulled it up and looked at it with a microscope. Or something, I mean, a magnifying glass. I don't know. <laughs> but anyhow, yeah, we had to cut the parts that the movie was made for in order to get an R rating uh, so we could get it released in uh, the theaters. We wouldn't take it unrated, and frankly, it's not so good in that version. Um, now, the, the one you can get on VHS, is that the uh, the unrated version? Both of them came out on VHS, rated and unrated. One was in a blue package, one was in a black package. Mm-hmm. And I'll say again, the, un- you know, that the unrated version is the one we all want to watch, not the other one. Yeah. Now, did you try to make the uh, like the, the gore scenes uh, realistic instead of maybe more comedic like some movies? Well, we thought they were pretty realistic, yeah. I mean, that's what we were shooting for. I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just felt like uh, all the death scenes, they were, uh, you know, it was more uh, realistic and um, seemed more serious than, uh, than, uh, than like a comedy. You know, there there are some there were some slasher movies at the time which uh, kind of went for uh, over the top and tried to make a, more of a, co- a comedy sense to it. Oh, but uh, I think the mutilator was definitely uh, more uh, serious in, in all the death scenes. Well, yeah, we were, but we were trying to have fun too. Right. I mean, we we were just having a good time. Mm-hmm. Um, someone here in the chat room they want to know uh, the official DVD release, but uh, we went over that earlier in the show. You're not exactly sure when it'll, it'll be uh, released. Yeah, we don't we don't have an official DVD release date. We're we're trying to come up with one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, he wants to know about the original uh, title, Fall Break, and why was it changed to the Mutilator? Fall Break was 
the title we started with. That was the working title, the shooting title. The the idea was, the concept was that fall and break had some mysterious, if not threatening, connotations. At the same time, it's what people in, the, in this part of the country call the Thanksgiving break from school. They call it fall break. And the idea was that it, we'd there be a sequel called Spring Break. Well, that didn't happen. <laughs> But we did our own advertising campaign with the TV spots, radio spots, the one sheet, and the movie trailer. And uh, when I got a distributor, he said, let me see your ad campaign. And so I showed it to him. He looked at it, and he shook his head. He said, buddy, I got to tell you, it's shit, top to bottom. (laughs) (laughs) So we flew the whole thing out, and uh, he sent us over to uh, an advertising firm in Times Square, and one of their secretaries came up with the title. Uh, she, they, 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 you know, we were all trying to come up with something, and she came up with that one, and we all agreed that should be it. And they came up with the ad campaign and the poster. And, well, we worked with them a little bit, but mostly it was uh, their doings. Uh, we got a fan here in the chat room, Astro Creep. He wants to know uh, why you never made another film. <laughs> I uh, lost so much money on the first one, uh, it took me a long time to dig my way out of the hole. And by the time I got back, uh, I was uh, I was a family man raising raising uh, my family and paying bills, and I had responsibilities. Ultimately, in 91, I, uh, when my children were, well, one was in college, one was just out of college, I sent myself to movie school at AFI in L.A., and I spent five and a half years out there after school uh, putting projects together and uh, got some interest, but I never sold one. Uh, why I never made another one, I, I guess I just didn't want to bankroll another one myself. Right. <laughs> did, did you have any ideas? Did you uh, write any scripts or anything? Oh, oh yeah. We've got, I got a stack of scripts. Uh, the, the, uh, the one that was going to be not really a sequel but a follow-up to mm-hmm. uh, The Mutilator was called Talk. It was uh, about there's a there's a, a, a an ancient Mayan god, Chuck Mool, I think his name is, and it dealt with an archaeology professor on a on a dig in Mexico who discovers a secret room in a, in a Mayan pyramid, and he and some of his graduate students go in there and they find this uh, golden, I mean this uh, Mayan warrior wearing a golden mask. He takes the mask up, and as he does, the body crumbles to dust, and uh, he takes the mask home, and some of his graduate students, unbeknownst to him, had taken little pieces of, little bits of dust and pieces of things from this body home with them, and all of a sudden, this Mayan warrior appears in this college town, USA, and starts doing in the uh, these students with, with his uh, big spears and arrows and, and Mayan ways. It turns out that the professor couldn't resist trying to mask on himself. And when he did, then he was uh, converted. He was transformed into this Mayan warrior, and he was going out and killing the people. Sort of a Jekyll and Hyde story. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's oh. pretty good. But that sounds good. good. Yeah, yeah. sounds pretty interesting. Uh, well, what advice would you give to uh, like an aspiring filmmaker who you know who had their idea when to, when to make a, a movie themselves? What advice would I give to somebody who wants to make a movie? Right. Today, uh, I guess I would, well, the bottom line is going to be do it. You know, whatever it takes, get it done. Get get it made. Get it finished. Uh, how to do it, I think now I would I would suggest shooting it on a, a high-density camera with a hard drive in it. I don't know what you call them. You know, just shoot, mm-hmm. go right to digital yeah. and uh, and do one. You know, don't. Don't don't try to shoot one in 35 millimeter. Write the screenplay and rewrite it and rewrite it. That's where the that's the key is rewriting. Get it tight, a lot, lot tighter than mine was. I didn't know at the time much about it. Uh, talk to people. Ask ask people who've done it. Uh, everybody would love to talk about it and give advice. Uh, you get somebody who's been there to help and give advice. Listen to people and remember, making a movie is a collaborative endeavor. It's not something one person can do. You look, you never know who's going to come up with the idea that makes it better. It may be the the caterer. You know, it just could be somebody standing around on the set. I'll give you an example uh, in the movie. 
the uh, shoot, the one with the stairs here in Deer D.C., the, the girl whose head turned to exorcist. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, they were filming the scene where the priest falls down those stairs, and there was, I forgot the director's name, but they were standing around, and somebody in the crowd said, that's not right. It's just somebody, you know, somebody standing around looking. He said, what do you mean? He said, in a, uh, a death by violent impact like that, it always knocks the shoe off. And so the director said, wow, they took one of the guy actor's shoes off, and if you look at that scene now, that one of the shoes has been knocked off the guy's foot, and it's a really good idea. So don't close your mind. Keep your mind open and listen to everybody. They, you don't have to do what everybody says. You don't have to take everybody's suggestion, but you really should listen to them all and weigh them and pick and choose. Mm-hmm. And they go do it. It's just it's a, it's a lot of fun. <clears throat> were, were you a fan of of uh, the slasher uh, like genre before uh, you made the movie? Oh yeah, I was, uh, and that's one of the reasons I made it was because I was a fan. Another reason was that Weekly Variety at the time was reporting that thirty percent of all tickets sold for motion pictures at the time were sold to horror pictures. I figured I had the best chance of getting my money back and making another picture if I made a horror picture. Right. So my timing was off. I, you know, about a year late. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what were like uh, some of the movies that you liked? So some of the slasher films. Oh, oh uh, gosh, I, I I wrote the uh, movie review column for the local newspaper for two years. I think I saw all of them. Uh, Halloween probably was uh, was the first one that I recall, and I particularly liked that one. Some one of the actresses I forgot who got hung over the uh, Dutch door in the laundry room. Maybe y'all remember that scene. Mm-hmm. And, oh, yeah. and then I, 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 I like the whole Halloween franchise and the Friday the 13th. Incidentally, uh, Jason from Friday 13th Part 2 is going to be there this weekend. If anybody yeah, likes Mark that. Joy. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's the name? Witty? Warrington Gillette. That's nothing that I, I must have the name wrong, but anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, Jason's going to be there. Right, right. Yeah, I like, I like the, uh, let's see, I remember, uh, was it was one of my birthday party or something or my my Valentine which took place in the mines? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Mother's, Mother's Mother's Day. Um, uh, my bloody Valentine. Yeah, he made that one. Huh? <laughs> my bloody Valentine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's it. Mm-hmm. We had the director so, uh, of that on uh, actually on Valentine's Day this year. No kidding. No, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was always actually one of my favorites too. So. Uh, I like I like just about all of them. I like them all. Mm-hmm. Uh, where where would you rate like uh, the mutilator along with those? Where would I rank it? Yeah. I'm like oh well, it was uh, it was my favorite it was <laughs> at the top. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of question was that? <laughs> <laughs> it was a loaded one in your favor. <laughs> no, that, that that was the answer I was expecting, of course. <laughs> well, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> No, I said that was the answer I was expecting. It's, it's the number one slasher film. All right. <laughs> now, uh, do, you, uh, do you still watch, like, uh, newer horror movies? Civil War movies? Uh, no, like uh, new horror films. Like uh, new, new ones. Horror. That, yeah. I, uh, as you can tell, and as I've mentioned, I'm hard of hearing. And as my hearing gets worse, I find I get a fewer and fewer movies. Uh, I don't watch television anymore unless it's a Carolina ball game. Uh, I went to the Harry Potter movies, and I went to see King Kong a couple of years ago. And, no, I haven't been to any of the new horror movies. I saw Kill Bill. That was pretty close to being a horror movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was pretty bloody. <laughs> uh, and uh, Aeon Flux, I don't think that was a horror movie, but it was, I don't know what you would call that, science fiction, I guess. Yeah. No. Uh, I'm not. I can't even name a recent horror movie. Uh, uh, who wrote the song that we, we talked about earlier, or the Fall Break song? Michael Menard, uh, musical genius. Uh, made him in New York City. He wrote the song. He wrote the music. He and uh, the guy who wrote the words to "Under the Boardwalk" collaborated on the lyrics, and he composed all of the music in the movie and performed all of the music in the movie. Wow. Either on a an instrument or on a synthesizer. Now, did he do that song for the movie, or was it something that he already did? Was that it like song, a, was it, it was, was written for the movie? Was, yeah. Now, when are any uh, now you can have it on uh, record at at the show. Do you ever think about me putting it on CD or something so uh, people could buy it? Well, we're gonna have 
45 RPM for sale. Oh, they uh, could actually buy this, the uh, record. <laughs> maybe, maybe their parents will still have something they can play <laughs> and they can do it. Uh, we will, we'll, uh, when the DVD comes out, that'll, it'll pro- that's, you know, that's a good thing to put on an alternate track. Just put the theme song on there. Oh, definitely. Uh, how did people like, uh, react to the movie when it first came out? Well, we had the premiere in Moorhead City and uh, invited everybody, and they liked it. They stood up and clapped, and these are people you wouldn't expect. I mean, the doctors and lawyers and people you wouldn't expect to see in a gore movie. Of course, it was fun for them because it was shot right there. The, uh, we watched it. We, we would go to theaters, large theaters on Times Square, and stand in the back, and uh, people loved it. Uh, they would talk to the audience and, oh, don't go in there, and that kind of thing. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. <clears throat> Let everybody know again that it's in, uh, it's going to be at the Horror Cinema Expo.com, and that's going to be at the Hagerstown, Maryland. It's at the Best Western Grand Venison Hotel. And you can call one eight seven seven four seven seven five eight one seven. And um, is there anything you'd like to uh, like tell the fans out there why they should come and uh, you know come and talk to you? No, uh, I I guess I'd like to say thanks. Uh, I'm glad to know that people out there still have fun with it. We had a lot of fun with it, and if, uh, if other people are out there now still having fun with it, that's great. I love it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and uh, along with you know um, they got the reunion of the mutilators, also uh, Fred Williamson, you know, Fred the Hammer Williamson. There's also uh, there's some professional wrestling people there, like Missy Hyatt, and uh, you mentioned Warrington Gillette from uh, Friday Thirteenth Part Two. So, you know, it's a, it's a, going to be a fun time, and uh, it's not very much. You know, you're not going to spend a fortune if you go there. So, That's a uh, good crew. That's yeah. you know, a good lineup of people. Yeah, definitely. Well, we want to appreciate you for coming on tonight. My pleasure. All right. So, uh, can we keep you here for a second. Yeah. Hey, man. This is Mark Warchar. And if you know what's right, if you know what's good, if you know what's best for you, listen to withoutyourhead.com. <laughs>